Imperium is a Latin word that, in a broad sense, translates roughly as power to command. In ancient Rome, different kinds of power or authority were distinguished by different terms. Imperium referred to the ability of an individual to command the military. It is not to be confused with auctoritas or potestas, different and generally inferior types of power in the Roman Republic and Empire. Primarily used to refer to the power that is wielded, in greater or lesser degree, by an individual to whom it is delegated, the term could also be used with a geographical connotation, designating the territorial limits of that imperium. Individuals given such power were referred to as curule magistrates or promagistrates. These included the curule aedile, the praetor, the consul, the magister equitum, and the dictator. Personal characteristic In ancient Rome, imperium could be used as a term indicating a characteristic of people, the wealth held in items, or the measure of formal power they had. This qualification could be used in a rather loose context for example, poets used it, not necessarily writing about state officials. However, in Roman society it was also a more formal concept of legal authority. A man with imperium imperator", had, in principle, absolute authority to apply the law within the scope of his magistracy or promagistracy. He could be vetoed or overruled either by a magistrate or promagistrate who was a colleague with equal power e.g. a fellow consul or by one whose imperium outranked his, that is, one of imperium maius greater imperium. Some modern scholars such as A. H. M. Jones have defined imperium as the power vested by the state in a person to do what he considers to be in the best interests of the state. Imperium can be distinguished from regnum, or royal power, which was inherited. Imperium was originally a military concept, the power of the imperator general in the army to command. The word derives from the Latin verb, imperare to command. The title imperator was applied to the emperor, who was the commander of the armed forces. In fact, the Latin word, imperator, gives us the English word, emperor. Imperium was indicated in two prominent ways. A curule magistrate or promagistrate carried an ivory baton surmounted by an eagle as his personal symbol of office compare the field marshal's baton. Any such magistrate was also escorted by lictors bearing the fasces traditional symbols of imperium and authority. When outside the pomerium, axes were added to the fasces to indicate an imperial magistrate's power to enact capital punishment outside Rome the axes were removed within the pomerium. The number of lictors in attendance upon a magistrate was an overt indication of the degree of imperium. When in the field, a curule magistrate possessing an imperium greater or equal to that of a praetor wore a sash ritually knotted on the front of his cuirass. Further, any man executing imperium within his sphere of influence was entitled to the curule chair. Curule aedile two lictors. Since a plebeian aedile did not own imperium, he was not escorted by lictors. Magister equitum, the dictator's deputy, six lictors. Praetor six lictors, two lictors within the pomerium. Consul twelve lictors each. Dictator twenty four lictors outside the pomerium and twelve inside. Starting from the dictatorship of Lucius Sulla, the latter rule was ignored because the dictator could enact capital punishment within Rome as well as without. His lictors did not remove the axes from their fasces within the pomerium. As can be seen, dictatorial imperium was superior to consular, consular to praetorian, and praetorian to aedilitian. There is some historical dispute as to whether or not praetorian imperium was superior to equine magisterial imperium. A promagistrate, or a man executing a curule office without actually holding that office, also possessed imperium in the same degree as the actual incumbents, i.e., proconsular imperium being more or less equal to consular imperium, propraetorian imperium to praetorian, and was attended by an equal number of lictors. Certain extraordinary commissions, such as Pompey's famous command against the pirates, were invested with imperium maius meaning they outranked all other owners of imperium of the same type or rank in Pompey's case, even the consuls within their sphere of command his being «ultimate on the seas, and within fifty miles inland». Imperium maius later became a hallmark of the Roman emperor. Another technical use of the term in Roman law was for the power to extend the law beyond its mere interpretation, extending imperium from formal legislators under the ever republican constitution, popular assemblies, senate, magistrates, emperor and their delegates to the jurisprudence of jurisconsults. Later 
While the Byzantine Eastern Roman emperors retained full Roman imperium and made the episcopate subservient, in the feudal West a long rivalry would oppose the claims to supremacy within post-Roman Christianity between sacerdotium in the person of the Pope and the secular imperium of the revived Western Roman emperor since Charlemagne. Both would refer to the heritage of Roman law by their titular link with the very city Rome, the Pope, Bishop of Rome, versus the Holy Roman Emperor even though his seat of power was north of the Alps. The Donatio Constantini, by which the papacy had allegedly been granted the territorial patrimonium Petri in central Italy, became a weapon against the emperor. The first pope who used it in an official act and relied upon it, Leo IX, cites the Donatio in a letter of 1054 to Michael Carularius, Patriarch of Constantinople, to show that the Holy See possessed both an earthly and a heavenly imperium, the royal priesthood. Thenceforth the Donatio acquires more importance and is more frequently used as evidence in the ecclesiastical and political conflicts between the papacy and the secular power. Anselm of Lucca and Cardinal Dusdedit inserted it in their collections of canons, Gratian excluded it from his Decretum, but it was soon added to it as Pelea. The ecclesiastical writers in defense of the papacy during the conflicts of the early part of the 12th century quoted it as authoritative. In one bitter episode, Pope Gregory IX who had several times mediated between the Lombards and the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II reasserted his right to arbitrate between the contending parties. In the numerous manifestos of the Pope and the Emperor the antagonism between church and state became more evident, the Pope claimed for himself the imperium animarum command of the souls i.e. voicing God's will to the faithful and the principatus rerum et corporum in universo mundo princedom over all things and bodies in the whole world, while the Emperor wished to restore the imperium mundi, imperium as under Roman law over the now Christian world, Rome was again to be the capital of the world and Frederick was to become the real emperor of the Romans, so he energetically protested against the authority of the Pope. The emperor's successes, especially his victory over the Lombards at the Battle of Cortenuova, 1237, only embittered the opposition between church and state. The Pope again excommunicated the "...self-confessed heretic", the "...blasphemous beast of the apocalypse." The 20th of March 1239 who now attempted to conquer the rest of Italy i.e. the papal states etc topic <inaudible> <inaudible> divine and earthly imperium In some monotheistic religions such as Christianity the Catholic Church where the official language, Latin, used terms as imperium dei, domini the divine is held to have a superior imperium, as ultimate king of kings, above all earthly powers. Whenever a society accepts this divine will to be expressed on earth, as by a religious authority, this can lead to theocratic legitimation. However, the Catholic Church and most other Christian groups acknowledge the authority of secular governments. If however a secular ruler controls the religious hierarchy, he can use it to legitimize his own authority. Thus absolute, universal power was vested under early Islam in the original caliphate before it became the political toy of worldly powers behind the throne and was even politically discarded by essentially secular princes, and later again claimed by Modus. The chief minister of Henry VIII, the Archbishop of Canterbury Thomas Cranmer suggested removal of the Roman Catholic papacy's imperium in imperio Latin for state within a state by requesting that Parliament pass the Act in Restraint of Appeals 1533 specifying that England was an empire and that the crown was imperial, and a year later the Act of Supremacy proclaiming the imperial crown protector and supreme head of the Church of England, in Orthodox Russia too, when Peter I the Great assumed the Byzantine imperial titles Imperator and Autocrator, instead of the Royal Tsar, the idea in founding the Russian Holy Synod was to put an end to the old imperium in Imperio of the Free Church, by substituting the Synod for the all too independent Patriarch of Moscow, which had become almost a rival of the Tsars Peter meant to unite all authority in himself, over church as well as state, through his Ober Procurator and Synod. The Emperor ruled his church as absolutely as the military through their respective ministries, he appointed its members just as he did generals, and the Russian government continued his policy until the end of the empire in 1917. See also Imperator Constitution of the Roman Republic Cursus Honorum Translatio Imperi Topic References
This article incorporates text from a publication now in the public domain, Herbermann, Charles, ed. 1913. Donation of Constantine. Catholic Encyclopedia. New York, Robert Appleton.